Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Last week, I reviewed a video game about a Russian invasion of Europe that was made about a year ago. This week, I'm taking a look at a more novel take on the same concept. By which I mean a novel. This is Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy. Well, I should back up a bit. It's been a while since I did an info dump, so let's talk a little bit about how this story came about. To do that, I need to talk a little bit about Larry Bond. No, Larry Bond. Do I need to hurt you? Thank you. So, Larry Bond was a miniatures wargamer, writer of techno thrillers, and he is the creator of the strategic level war game Harpoon. Harpoon is a game which allows the player to play a hypothetical war between NATO forces and the Warsaw Pact during the Cold War. For those of you not old enough to remember the Cold War, the Warsaw Pact was an alliance made up of the Soviet Union and basically its Eastern European vassal states made to counter the influence of NATO. In essence, it's made up of every country between East Germany and Russia, with a few exceptions. And if you don't know what East Germany is, just ask your parents. Or grandparents. God, I feel old. Anyway, according to literary legend, since literary le the literary field has legends as opposed to just general tales but behind the scenes, much like the blues, um, Red Storm Rising was fueled by a game of harpoon played by Bond and Clancy. It's unclear about whether the two, at least to my knowledge, if they knew each other before they played the game, or if they met on a publicity tour, and Larry Bond said, Hey, I designed this board game, which is kind of based off stuff from the Navy. I'll try to be accurate. Want to play it? I don't know how this came about, but... In any case, what I do know is this. Both Cl Clancy and Bond have said that Red Storm Rising came out of the two of them playing the game of Harpoon. And, indeed... After they wrote the book, they make sure everything was would work. They play tested several sequences in the game to make sure it would fit in the rules, and thus, in theory, it would happen with a real military action, more or less. Um, so, no particulars of the conversations that Bond and Clancy had during the game have come out. But I have an educated guess, which goes something like this. Now, from what I've heard. Larry Bond was, for a time, a member of Dave Arneson's Dungeons & Dragons group. For those unfamiliar with the history of D&D, while both Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson worked together to create the rules for Dungeons & Dragons, Arneson favored a play style that was different from that from Gary Gygax. While Gary focused on the dungeon crawl, and this is shown by the classic module Castle Greyhawk, okay, not the module, but the original Castle Greyhawk dungeon, and that the sainting basically came out of the original dungeon later, Dave Arneson wanted to explore more of the setting. Adventures out in the wilderness, and when you did go in the dungeon, thought out, basically, well, who built this dungeon and why? And thus, his campaign setting of Blackmore basically was considered to be the first real campaign setting for a tabletop role-playing game. Gygax's Greyhawk would come later, Again, spawned out of the Castle Greyhawk Mega Dungeon, but Arneson came first. Also, as a wargamer, Larry Bond would certainly have subscribed to various wargaming magazines, like Wargamer's Digest pictured here. Now, these magazines would have had reviews and ads for upcoming games, and new optional rule suggestions, all that sort of thing. They also would have had what were known as after-action reports. After action reports are basically the wargaming equivalent of the actual play. If you haven't read one before, an actual play is basically when you write down what happened in your tabletop role-playing session, what the players did, you write down cute little clips and so forth about how the players acted in character, and you post that in a somewhat fictionalized fashion to take out all of the, oh, he rolled, and then he rolled a 20 and all that other sort of mechanical stuff and let it flow as a narrative. To a certain degree, if your game sto if story, once you've written it up, either as an after-action report or as a write-up of a game session, if it fits in with what reality is supposed to be for the setting you're playing in or what have you, you can tell it's a good system. And you know, oftentimes it can hook 
players and do playing a system. So sometimes with these wargaming magazines at the time, you'd have people replaying classic battles using 2020 hindsight, more or less, like Gettysburg or other stuff. But sometimes you'd have people running completely new scenarios, at which point sometimes they would put in a story here for why they're fighting over this crossroads, or what's so important about this hill, and that sort of thing. Finally, there's the simple matter of table talk. These games, miniatures, war games, that sort of thing, don't play as quickly as chess or similar games where you're having focusing 100% of your mental energy on the game itself. Um, just, just because due to how simple the moves are, and to a certain degree how simply you, you, it is to plan very far ahead. It's the same sort of thing as with Go. For a game like uh, Harpoon, where there's such a degree of random chance involved, in addition to all the strategic planning and that sort of stuff that you're doing as well, honestly, you're going to be doing stuff during the game. With tabletop role-playing games and board games, whatever, oftentimes it's just tabletop, it's little conversations. How's the wife? How's the kids? With both people involved being writers, there's a distinct possibility that the talk went in the direction of shop. This is the story that I've been working on. I mean, not really not this story, but working on or that sort of thing, but talking about previous stories they've written, how those stories came about, Clancy talking about the people he knows in the Navy, Bond talking about his own experiences in the Navy, all that sort of thing. At which point, Larry Pond probably some point in here Bond talked about playing Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe before, maybe during, maybe after, anyway. And at some point talked about how Dave Arneson approaches approached world building by talking about world building and the motivations for why dungeons were built and who built this dungeon and all sorts of other stuff. And this different approach of, to role playing. This probably led after the game, do or even during the game, talking about okay. Why would this war have happened? Why would this conflict have happened? What would the what would the generals in the battlefield have been like? What would the captain of this destroyer in the North Atlantic, what would he be like as a person? And ultimately, from this, we get Red Storm Rising. The book's story begins with an attack on a Russian oil refinery in Siberia by Islamic extremists who are bitter over the invasion of Afghanistan and being treated like second-class citizens by the Russian government. The refinery is destroyed, thus greatly limiting Soviet oil supplies and leading to unrest among the Soviet people. The Politburo, realizing they need to secure new sources of oil to make up for this while they repair the, the plant and do all the other things they need to do, decide that they need to invade the Middle East and seize their oil stores, ignoring the fact that pissing off Muslims was kind of how this all started in the first place. However, stopping them from invading isn't a sudden outbreak of common sense, but instead recognition of the fact that, under the Carter Doctrine, the U.S., and thus NATO, would get involved in any invasion of the Middle East in an attempt to make sure that the Middle East oil stores stayed open and available for all NATO member nations, and for that matter, the rest of the world. So, realizing that they need to break up NATO, or at least thinking that way, they decide to stage a terrorist attack on the Kremlin using a German sleeper agent to justify an invasion of Germany. Thus, the plan goes that NATO member nations will be forced to decide whether to side with the horrible child murdering. West German terrorists, or the noble, peace-loving Soviet forces out to overthrow a corrupt regime. So, at least the writers of Modern Warfare 2 read this book, even if the writers of 3 hadn't. Frankly, would have rather the writers of 3 had read it instead. Ultimately, the only NATO member nations the Soviets managed to persuade are Greece, Turkey, and Italy, none of whom are in any position to get involved anyway, with the U.S., U.K., France, and naturally West Germany not buying into any of this. And keeping this conflict from turning into a true world war, the Japanese government stands behind their constitutionally mandated non-interventionist policies and asks the U.S. to keep their forces in Japan and Okinawa out of it. And the U.S. happily obliges, since the Soviets are focusing all their attentions on West Germany, so they don't need to use those forces in this war at all. Additionally, 
East Germany asks the Soviet Union to please refrain from using chemical and biological and other weapons of mass destruction in this, because ultimately, if they do manage to reunify Germany, they'd rather not have to decontaminate it once they'd gotten it. This does an excellent job of keeping the war entirely focused on your standard, normal, conventional weapons, you know, machine guns, normal bombs, that sort of thing, as opposed to going from zero to gamma world in about five seconds. As a minor little aside, going back to Modern Warfare 3, why wouldn't the NATO powers who got hit with biological weapons, effectively weapons of mass destruction, in fact, I would say they were weapons of mass destruction considering the effects they had, that we saw happen in the game, why wouldn't they expound with nuclear weapons of their own? I mean, you just got hit with weapons of mass destruction. You had massive civilian casualties, and your major major population centers were likely anyone who survived was forced to be evacuated. This is the point where buttons get pushed. I mean, are you afraid they'll nuke you more? Are you afraid of radioactively mutated biological weapons? Teenage Mutant Germ... Teenage Mutant Ninja Bacterium? saying. So, the Soviets do a two-pronged attack. While pushing their forces across the German border, they also take out the U.S. base at Iceland, which controls the SOSIS Early Warning Net. Basically, this means that the U.S. Navy has no idea where the Soviet submarines, attack or boomer, are. However, a squad of U.S. Marines manages to escape, led by an Air Force lieutenant and meteorologist, named Michael D. Edwards. In this part of the plot, Edwards and his band of soldiers basically serve as a guerrilla reconnaissance force, reporting on Soviet troop movements in Iceland while trying to stay one step ahead of the Soviet military's attempts to find them. The plot from here also leads to a series of vignettes about the various fronts in the war. We see the invasion of Germany from both the Soviet and American perspectives. Both sides are depicted sympathetically, with neither one not quite being able to get the upper hand. Clancy does a really good job of depicting the fog of war here. Um, neither side is able to quite tell how effective or ineffective their attacks and counterattacks are, and thus neither is able to break the stalemate. The U.S. is able to do catastrophic damage to the Soviets through their air attacks and that sort of thing, but they are unable to quite tell that they're doing this well, and they are taking heavy losses of their own. The Soviets don't know how catastrophic the losses that they're dealing to the Americans are, but they also know they're taking too heavy losses to keep this up for too long. It makes the story really interesting. Um, the main characters here that we go back to a lot is Soviet General, or rather Soviet Colonel General, Pavel Leonidovich, Le Leonidovich Alexiev, and I apologize for mentioning the name, the Commander-in-Chief of the German Offensive. Alexiev is a, depicted as an intelligent and competent commander who is saddled with a war he didn't want, with a too restrictive command structure, and the fact that, to a certain degree, from an equipment standpoint, he is simply outmatched by the equipment of the Americans, Brits, and Germans, and French he's facing. By the way, the French play a major role in this, and it's props to Clancy for giving the French their due in this war. The next plot covers the war at sea, following the carrier battle groups and convoy escorts of the U.S. Navy as they try to protect the supply convoys, sending troops and material to the well, Europe, basically trying to reinforce Fortress Europe, or whatever melodramatic term you want to use on this. The plots here involve some really intense cat-and-mouse naval battles throughout the North Atlantic, whether it's the convoy is fending off Soviet submarine attack, and kind of an interesting spin on the sort of run silent, run deep thing, to U.S. submarine commanders taking on either Soviet submarines on their own, or taking on Soviet naval convoys. The main ships here being followed are the destroyers USS Ferris and the USS Reuben James, both commanded by skipper, uh, both skippered by Commander Edward Morris, and the USS Chicago on the submarine front, uh, skippered by Commander Dan McCafferty. 
Finally, linking all these plots together is NSA analyst Jack Ryan, er, <clears throat> Robert Toland, sorry. Unlike Jack Ryan, Toland bosses are actually sane, competent people and recognize that under the circumstances, the important place for an analyst to be and where he's most useful is, you know, being an analyst at a desk where he has access to information from all sorts of sources. Thus, I wouldn't call him the frame narrative, but I would say he would actually be best, I guess the best term would be the hub narrative. All the information from the front lines in Germany, from the uh, naval escort front, in terms of for relating to Soviet submarine activity and to what the U.S. at Chicago is observing, to the information that's being sent in from Lieutenant Edwards in Iceland, all of it basically comes through him and the office he's at in Scotland. Thus, he gets to see the big picture, and in turn, he can give that big, that big picture to the audience, which is, frankly, a perfect place to be, and it really serves well to tie everything together and help give the audience a sense of geography, not in term, not just in terms of the actual geography of the war, but also in terms of what's going on in what theaters. It's really well done. Fortunately for the book, this is not one of Clancy's very spy-focused books, with some of the more spy stuff, Cardinal of the Kremlin, to a certain degree also Clear and Present Danger, less Clear and Present Danger, more some of all fears, the other stuff, there tends to be a more focus on the secret agent crap and characters who know everything, who know everything that's involved in conversation, talking about, talking to each other using jargon that would be commonly used in the field. That's all well and good, but unless you can infer this all yourself, or you've encountered these terms and had them explained in several books before, it's a pain in the butt to read. And we don't get that here. It focuses on the military aspects, at which point Clancy feels comfortable enough to put in nice big asides, basically giving it a techno battle. Well, not big in terms of, like, giant big blocks that stop the narrative dead, like certain other writers do. Hi, David Weber. Um, but, in this case, little blocks here and there that help explain, okay, this is how the phalanx missile defense system works. And this is the number of missiles it can handle. In fact, this is used for a wham line at a uh, point in the story that where, well, a carrier battle group gets clobbered by more, by basically a Macross missile massacre in terms of just millions and millions of, no, not millions and millions, but okay, hundreds and hundreds of missiles. Which, when you only have so many phalanx batteries that can only track so many missiles, is enough. In fact, that's the gist. You know, the computer system is designed to be able to handle so many missiles, or its processing systems are able to handle so many missiles, and it has so many missiles to fire back at its targets. And there's a counter... In terms of interception... I can't speak. In terms of interception missiles. It's kind of complicated, I'm phrasing it poorly, but you're giving an idea, and... They only handle so many missiles being shot at it. What's not capable, what's not able to understand is when more missiles than that are fired. So thus, while this is Clancy's first bullet stopper of a novel, and let me tell you, you could probably bullet through for car with a, with a bunch of these. While it's, a, while it's a bullet stopper, it doesn't feel like it. It flows. We have enough small little plot threads that bounce back and forth each of them are captioned, so we say, okay, we're on the USS Ferris, now we're in Scotland, now we're back on the Ferris again. Oh, now we're back in Iceland with the characters there. We're bouncing back and forth between them, and we have captions to tell you who, who's your talk, nah, who's there, who they are. Maybe not, maybe not just straight, straight, a straight-up dramatic personae, but in terms of you're in Scotland now, which means you're dealing with these people. You're in Iceland now, which means you're dealing with these people. They're also good about reusing names in terms of when you go back to Iceland, everyone talks to each other, gives last name stuff, give you a quick primer. Okay, it's these people. It doesn't feel out of place. Whereas, like, 
Okay, Skipper, what do you think we need to do? Well, Morowitz, oh, well, Horowitz, what we need to do is blah, blah, blah. It's, okay, it's the Skipper and Horowitz and, or whatever, it's Lieutenant Toland, that sort of thing. It flows. It, everything just fits organically. And this is why, I've gone on limb and say this, this is the greatest work of Clancy's career. Better than Hunt for October. Better than Clear and Present Danger. Better than Patriot Games. Better than... Okay, Rainbow Six was terrible, never mind that. But this is, frankly, Clancy's magnum opus. Or in this case, Clancy and Bond's magnum opus. Which is also impressive, because near as I can tell, this is the first novel Larry Bond wrote. But still, I mean, honestly, I have to say, Larry Bond got short shrift on this. This is, is this the first edition? No, this is the second edition, but still. On the cover, Tom Clancy, no mention of Larry Bond. Opening up the book, cover page inside of the book, Tom Clancy, no mention of Larry Bond. But further, an acknowledgement, it is impossible for Larry and me, no mention given who Larry is. Um, yeah. Larry Bond kind of got screwed on this one. Um, in any case, it's a good book. I enjoy it. I think you will too. And actually, you know what? Of all the Clancy novels that were adapted to television and the big screen, frankly, I really disappointed that some of all fears, which I think is a really disappointing novel, was it was picked when on when you took the same budget from some of all fears and used it to turn this into an HBO miniseries, maybe a less lesser well known cast, but with good CGI use of CGI for the military hardware and some of the more ambitious stuff. I think this would have made an incredible miniseries with probably the same budget. Um, you only need, like, one season, maybe two, and you're done. 12 to 24 episodes. Easy. And it would have been a better, better work of uh, visual storytelling. And more exciting and interesting to watch than some of all here was. Fears was. And without any of the unnecessarily incredulous stuff in terms of I mean that that just that that story itself and the book itself has that the movie does not, or the, or the the book has the movie does not and the that both have in common like the vast neo-Nazi conspiracy. Anyway, as it is, Red Storm Rising was adapted to a computer game as well as, in a degree of cyclicalism, that's a new word by the way, that would make Roger Waters and possibly also James Burke do the happy dance. A tabletop war game published by TSR, the company founded by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. Next week, well, it's, it's, again, it's a video game week, so this time we'll take a look at an open world video game. The Saboteur, the last title to come out with Pandemic Studios, and with some fun, exciting, Nazi face-punching action. So until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thank you for watching.